Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back here again. What's new? (laughs) Rumor has it that I may not be coming back here so often. And if things go the way it would seem like God is directing on the 20th, just a couple of weeks from now, I won't need to come back here so often, and I will be delighted. I, uh, I, I of course, want to thank my, uh, my hair and makeup team back there who are taking good care of me. Do we have screens, guys? We do have screens. See, Mr. Murphy has been expunged from that system. Very good. I'm also delighted to tell you that uh, Lori Moniger has been promoted from my makeup person to my agent and business manager. She's no longer part of the, the makeup team. She let me know that very firmly. I also have, I I came bearing gifts. Because because you haven't had a pastor, uh, you therefore weren't represented at the annual gathering that we have in May. We do it in Tuscarora, Pennsylvania. Next year we'll be doing it in Lancaster, which is not too far. Um, And so I expect to see the new pastor there, whoever that one might be. And we gave these out to all of our churches. And this is to be given to probably John Arndt, who is the, uh, the head of the trustee committee, right, or team. Um, John, this is to be mounted in a prominent place and done in a professional manner to let you know that Abundant Life Baptist Church is part of Venture Church Network, and you've been for a long time. So hang this up prominently. Um, the next time I come back, I'll check to see if, if it's here. If it's not here, then I'm going to track down John and then I'm going to go find Steve, and then I'm going to go find Mark, and we'll we'll make sure. So this is for you. We want to thank you for the many years of support that this church has been to our network. Our network is nearly 100 churches in now eight states. You guys are the furthest west of our edge. Uh, You and Fred McCloskey's place, Calvary Baptist, you are the westernmost edge of, of our network. And we're, I'm glad to come out here all the time and see you all. But this is just a, a reminder to me when I come, and it'll be a reminder to you that you've been part of something bigger than you for a long time. And your financial help to us is allowing us to help churches that get into real trouble. This church got into a scrape, but it wasn't in real trouble, really. Um, you are the little engine that could, and you kept right on going despite some lumpy times. and. Your helping us is able to help churches that are looking at closing, frankly. And I'm able to go to other places along with my team, and I'm able to see them come back from extinction or whatever they would happen to need, because we exist to help you take bold next steps, whatever they are. Your bold next step, I think, is going to be August the 20th. So I expect you all here. I expect you all to come in excited. I expect to see the right vote because I will be locking the doors and making sure that no one leaves until we get to the right vote. All right. So thank you for letting me be here once again. I'll give this to, uh, to Mark or John or, or Steve when I'm done. Thank you. I feel a little bit like a Jewish matchmaker because it was me who brought Rob Williams' name to your search team. And um, it normally doesn't go like this, but this time it did. And so may God bless you and his family as you come together on the 20th to finalize what we believe God's will to be for this church. And that's all I'm going to say about that without getting into any further trouble. So today's message comes from a series that I did. It's called The Good Work, and uh, it's a four-part series, and maybe sometime over the the next many months, maybe I'll be able to do all four of them with you, but we're, we're gonna look at the first one, and the first one is called, Somebody Ought to Do Something About That. Or as I have on the screen, I think it's somebody has to do something about that. How many times have you been in a situation you or your wife or your family or somebody, and you run into something and you look at it and you think, somebody ought to do something about that. You've all felt that, right? Please say yes so that we're not here till two. Good, thank you, wow. 
So it, it could be something simple like an intersection that you know is dangerous and there had been an accident there and it took out the traffic light and it's a busy intersection. And it goes on that way for weeks and months where the lights don't work. And you know that somebody else is gonna get killed there if they don't fix that. And you say to yourself, somebody ought to do something about that. Kathy and I have to travel quite a bit. Kathy for her business, me with mine. I travel more than she does. And we have to normally use the Philadelphia International Airport. How many have been there? A few of you. It's a zoo down there in South Philly. Um, the only redeeming quality is that you have to travel past the Philly Stadium and the Eagle Stadium, and that's always fun. If I lived out here, I'd feel the same way about the, the Steelers and the Pirates. So we were, Kathy was picking me up from the airport from going somewhere, and it was around this time of the year, it was July, it was boiling hot, and this is maybe uh, 15 years ago. We're leaving the airport, and if you've been there, you leave the airport and you go north on 95. You're not yet into the city of Philadelphia. You have to cross over a couple of bridges. Are you familiar with crossing bridges around here? This, this is the bridge capital of the world here. Um, it is amazing. You guys could, could take down every iron bridge that you have in the Pittsburgh area and sell it for scrap and fund the national debt. I mean, it, it's just amazing. So there is a big bridge that goes right by the Philadelphia Naval Yard, and right before you get to that bridge, you come up a slight incline. Pay attention, this is gonna make sense now, all right? Everybody listening? You're coming up a slight incline, you're doing about 55 miles an hour or so, and you go around a, an uphill sweeping left turn. It's not particularly steep, but it's not shallow either. You come out of that turn and down flat before you go over top of a double-decker bridge. And those of you who have been there, you can picture this. We're leaving the airport. We are probably eight to 10 cars behind a large stake-bodied flatbed truck. And in that truck is stacked all kinds of brick. Some it's used brick, some it's new brick. It's stacked up to the top of the stake-bodied sides and it goes from the cab to the tailgate and he's going too fast as he's coming up the hill and going around the turn. I imagine he's thinking he's gotta gain some speed to get up and around this turn. Everybody with me so far? Keep nodding so we're not here until two. Good. There, he's about eight to 10 cars in front of us and as he goes up around the turn, the stake bodied sides on the left hand side all snap off and break from the weight of the brick shifting over. And when they break and fall off, all the brick scatters across two lanes and both shoulders. I mean, we're talking probably, I don't know, 10,000 brick, something like that, maybe more. It's in the roadbed and everybody comes to a stop and it's boiling hot. And we're all sitting in our cars and like has happened with you when this has happened, eventually, in my case, doesn't take long. I open the door and I stand on the door sill and I look up to see what the problem is. Well, I don't even need to stand on the door sill because I can see that the roadbed is covered this deep with brick and nobody's going anywhere. So we hear through the grapevine because now other people are out of the car and they're starting to call and they're learning that the Philadelphia uh, Public Works Department is sending an articulated bucket vehicle there to scoop all this up and get it to the side of the road. And it's going to take hours. It's boiling hot. People's tempers are rather short as it is. I looked at Kathy and she had the same thought that I did. And we're all out of our cars and other people around us have the same thought too, two or three or four other guys. And you know what we did? We said, we got enough people. There's, there's a mile of traffic backed up. We're gonna walk down about 20 cars and invite people out of their cars to get sweaty, and we're gonna form a human chain, and we're gonna pass four brick at a time. You, you can hold, those of you who work in construction, you can stack two bricks on top of each other and hold them together and pass them four at a time. We formed a human chain, and in 20 minutes, we had that roadbed cleared. We threw them into the field next to that. I'm sure the driver wasn't real happy or the person who owned the truck, but hey, the road's got to get open and there's miles of cars behind us. We hand by hand with a team of maybe 60, 80 people 
took that big pile of brick, and in 20 minutes, we were sweating, but we had it all in the field next door, and we went on our way. And that is what we're talking about when I say, you look at something and you say, somebody ought to do something about that. Well, we're going to look into that today, and we're going to look from the, the book of Nehemiah. How many have heard, read, or listened to sermons on the book of Nehemiah? Okay, that's only about a third of you, so I, I need to do a little backstory for you. I'm going to speak in generalities about dates. Everybody's eyes glazes over when you talk about uh, 546 BC. Everybody, what? So we're just going to talk in generalities. Don't pin me down on the exactness of the dates. This is just to make the story move along, okay? Nod your heads. Yes? Good. About a thousand years before Jesus was here was the high point of Israel's life. We had King David, we had King Solomon. Everybody good? Everybody know? Okay. In King Solomon's time, his successor, his sons, were fighting with each other as brothers because each was annoyed that they didn't get the throne outright. And in a generation or two after Solomon, Israel fell into a civil war. I mean, the kind of civil war like we had in this country 160 years ago. It was bad and it was bloody. And it weakened Israel. They went from the high point of King David and King Solomon to being the most respected nation in that part of the world. They went from that to being a weakened country, vulnerable to rising superpowers. Does this make any sense with what's going on today in our world? We know there are rising superpowers, and there are superpower wannabes, little countries, but they have nuclear weapons, and they want to have that kind of authority. Well, that was going on then, too. They were called first the Babylonians, and then the Assyrians, and then the Persians. They were all coming to power, and each one in their time, in the next 500 years, would become the world superpower in that area. I'm getting a little bit in front of myself. So after Israel suffers a horrible civil war, over the next couple of hundred years, the country splits in two. Israel is roughly the size of New Jersey, but without the kink in it. It's up and down like a, like a rectangle. It divides north and south. The northern part is called Israel. The southern part, for you Bible students, you already know, is called Judah. Jerusalem is in Judah. So now we have two distinct countries because they had been in a, in a horrible civil war that weakened them. So the rising superpower of Babylon sweeps in and they conquer the upper part of what used to be Israel, the country, now called just simply Israel, the northern part. They conquer that and they strip the country bare. They take anything of any value, including human slavery. They take kids who are bright and show promise, and they take them back to Babylon, and they install them in various points of government, and they put their, their own district commanders in charge up there. Meanwhile, southern Israel is hanging on by its fingernails, and it will for a couple of hundred more years, until somewhere around five or 600 years before Christ, it falls too. The Assyrians come in, and then the Persians come in, and they plunder Jerusalem. They take everything of value, including human beings, and they take them back 600 miles to their capital city. At the time of this story, now it's the Persians that have come in and done this. They are the reigning superpower. And now we have multiple generations of people who are Jews who have never seen the ancestral homeland. They are 600 miles away in an enemy capital being made to serve in some manner or other. And the best and brightest of them are installed in high positions in that pagan country's system of government. Nehemiah is one of them. Nehemiah has never set foot in the ancestral homeland of Israel. He was born there. He was one bright guy, and he had talent, and he was spotted early. And at the time where we pick up this story, we're talking about a Jerusalem that's wrecked 
the walls around Jerusalem, I'll get to that in just a minute, the walls around Jerusalem, the temple, and the prominent housing inside of the city walls are flattened over three different superpowers coming in over the period of three or 400 years. At the time of this story, we are somewhere around 550. Don't hold me to the exact date. I told you it's gonna be in generalities. If you wanna fight with me later, I'll meet you out front. If it's bad, I'll meet you out back. You can laugh, it's all right. So at the time of this story, we're about 550 BC, and the Persians run the place, and they have installed their own, their own district commanders, both north and south. And Israel is a poor country, both the upper and the lower, it, they're poor. The southern half is doing a little bit better because they can grow things more. The north has to depend on the Sea of Galilee for fishing, and it's tough up there and they're coming south to try to get to the food. That was also true in Jesus' time. This is why we have deacons today in the church, because in the first century when the church was getting started, there was a stream of people coming from up north for food, and that's why the disciples then said, we need something called deacons to help with all these people who were needy. We need to have the world's best and biggest food pantry here in Jerusalem. That's how we got deacons, by the way. I digress. That, that was for, for free. You can pay me after the service. So at the time of this story, we're 550 BC before Jesus gets here. Nehemiah has risen to the rank of what your King James Bible calls the king's cupbearer. Sounds uh, Shakespearean, doesn't it? Sounds like, what does this mean? What this means is that everything the king eats or drinks is first eaten and drunk by Nehemiah to make sure it's not poisoned. This is a horribly important position. It's not just some slave that you're gonna waste and burn. This guy has talent, and he's risen to the point of like almost the king's second in command. He's risen to that point, and he is trusted. He is trusted by King Artaxerxes because He's eating everything the king is going to eat, and he's drinking everything the king is going to drink because he's making sure the king is not going to be poisoned because in those days there was a lot of vying for power. And if you could get rid of the king and install your own family, you would do that. And kings are different than elected officials today. They do whatever they want. They make whatever laws they want. They act in a manner that is not always for the people. Wait, I said it was different than today. So. Thank you for laughing. Kings had a lot of power. Kings could have you killed just on their own whim. Nehemiah is his trusted confidant. He's in the inner circle. He's a Jew who's never seen Jerusalem. There are some Jews still left in the land because the superpowers would appoint the best and brightest of them to be the district commanders up and down, as well as install their own people. One of the people they install is Nehemiah's brother. His name is Hananiel. He is in the ancestral homeland. He is in the Jerusalem district. He sees how wrecked the, con the country is and the city is, and he's, he's wanting to do something about it. So he writes a letter to Big Brother, who is the king's confidant and has some real juice. You know what I mean? Nehemiah gets this letter, and he is brokenhearted, as we'll see in just a moment. And God puts in his heart something when he reads the letter, he says to himself, somebody ought to do something about this. And he is uniquely in a position, if the king will agree, because remember, this king is no friend of the Lord God of the Hebrews. If the king will agree, we might be able to do something about this, but it's going to take his backing. It's going to take his lumber yard. It's going to take his stone quarry. It's going to take his army to protect us. And we're going to rebuild those walls. How many have heard that in Nehemiah's time, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem? How, how many have heard that? Okay, that's about the, the same third, probably the same third that read the book or heard a sermon on it, right? All right, let me tell you about these walls. These are not like eight-foot walls that you would see around a, a compound in a gated community today. These walls are 40 feet high. They're as high probably as the floor to 
the top of your peaked roof right there. They're 40 feet high. They are nine feet at the base. There are nine giant doors, pairs of doors called gates, all around a two and a half mile wall. Two and a half miles, 40 feet high, nine feet at the base with these giant doors and each one of these entry points into the city did something different. Some were for cattle, some were for water, some were to take all the refuse out. That was their sewer system back then. I'm not gonna get any more descriptive of that because lunch is in about an hour. This is a monumental task that's sitting in front of them because one guy said somebody ought to do something about this. So let's go to the scripture and see what God has for us with all this. Jay, don't, don't worry. If, if something goes wrong, I'll just hold this up and everybody can look at it from here, okay? We're, we're all good. So today's passage that we did not read was Nehemiah 1 and 2. So we're, we're going to kind of spin our way through that to get some sense of what's going on here. So if we can go to the third screen, what is Nehemiah's response to being, to being challenged with this good work? He's the one who's saying somebody ought to do something about that. The first thing you see when you read chapters one and two, and I would, I would urge you to read chapters one and two. If you don't, I'll come back here on the 20th, lock the doors and make sure that you vote in the right way. Nehemiah becomes brokenhearted. You are entering a church season right now that has every earmark after the 20th of moving into your next season, doesn't it? Would you admit to a certain amount of ramped up excitement about that? You ought to be, or I'm gonna check your pacemaker, make sure that it's working right. You ought to be excited about this. You are, you are entering into what looks to be your next season of life. And let me tell you what happens in almost every church that I work with. We've been out, we've been without a pastor for so long. We've been hanging on, we've been, giving, we've been supporting our church, we've been doing it all alone. This Ron guy comes from the other side of the state now and then, Jesse Boggs comes in now and then, but we've been hanging on and now we have our new guy. <sighs> now we can relax and sit back and let him just do it all. That is a recipe for a failure, both for you and for this next guy. And I'm not saying that you have to do his job for him, I know a fair amount about him. In fact, I was the one who introduced him to the, the team. He'll be just fine. He'll, he'll be what you need if God works all this out on the 20th, if, 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 allegedly, 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 don't take me to a court of law. He'll be just fine in what he's doing, but you have to continue being the church during that time. You have to be the ones who say, somebody ought to do something about that when you notice. There's a couple of skylights out in that lobby. And if you look up, you'll see that there's blue tarp over the skylights. Why? Because the skylights are leaking. Why? Because all skylights leak. They are a leak looking for a place to happen. That's what my father used to say in our construction company. Well, yours are too. And the drywall tape is starting to peel and you'll see that out there. And probably one of you have looked at that besides John Arndt or any of the other guys and said, you know, somebody ought to do something about that. Well, maybe it's you. Maybe it will be you that does something about that. Ron, I don't know how to do that. Well, there's guys and girls that do know how to do that. So offer yourself. That's where Nehemiah finds himself right now. But the first place it starts is to be broken hearted about something. And Nehemiah is broken hearted. Why? because this is his ancestral homeland. He's never been there before, but he knows all the stories. He knows the richness of his faith. He knows what the temple in Jerusalem represents. It represents the house of God. Now, let's be clear about something. Jerusalem was where the house of God was. It was where Israel for centuries associated with being connected to the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh, Jehovah God. This is not the house of God. 
sounds blasphemous, doesn't it? This is a building that the people of God come to meet in. We are the body of Christ. Church is not this. Church is us. We can be in a field. We can be in a tent. As my great-grandmother would say, we could be in an auto mechanic's garage on Sunday morning. And where we are is where the church is. This is not the house of God. That was Israel. And Nehemiah knows this. He's grown up with it. He knows it. And he's brokenhearted because the temple is flat, the walls are flat, and everybody around in other countries is making fun of and running down the name of the Jehovah God who helped them build their nation at his direction by his sovereignty. He's brokenhearted about it. Listen to what he says in verse 4 of chapter 1. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. His response to somebody should do something about this, the very first thing that happens is he's brokenhearted. And he weeps over it. And I'm telling you, maybe there's not something as dire as walls being smashed flat. In fact, this is a very fine building. I commend you all years ago for deciding to build this and keeping it up and doing it well. We're not looking at something as dire as what they were looking at. But there's some repair work around here, and I don't mean the skylights. I mean, it's time to pick up for your next new season, right? Now, I am not going to compare you, this church, I'm not comparing you to the Jerusalem that's wrecked and sacked right now. That's not you. It was for them. And Nehemiah was brokenhearted about it. But there are things around here, ministries to begin, things to start to happen, things to start to dream about, that one or more of you is going to say, somebody ought to do something about that. There's a school across the street. Do we have anything in that school that plants our flag? There's a mile in a valley with every eatery you can think of, a quarter mile from here. And I know because I've tried to eat most of them in the last two years when I've been here. Some of them I would not recommend. For the right amount of money paid by those guys, I will recommend certain of them. And um, Mark Poach and I have tried to eat our way through some of them, I have to tell you, over the last two years. There's a whole valley of businesses that sprang up in the last 15, 20 years because of the interstate, right? When I came out here 40, 45, 50 years ago, that was not there. The town of Washington was there, a quaint town, still there. There's all manner of opportunity here for ministry, and one or more of you is saying right now, or will be saying in the near future, somebody ought to do something about that. And the first thing that happens is you become brokenhearted about it. The next thing that happens is that Nehemiah kneel, he kneels down and he prays. Same chapter. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, and my father's house have committed against you. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, this man being the king. Nehemiah is going to go in and ask the king, I'm going to need a couple of battalions of soldiers to protect me on the 600-mile journey. I'm going to need them to stay with me. I'm going to need the provisions from you, king, not just to rebuild the walls, but that we can be fed because nothing grows there anymore. He's going in for a big ask. And if it turns out wrong, he can be deposed from his position. And if it really goes sideways, the king can have him killed. And Nehemiah knows this. No wonder he's praying. But notice what he's praying. He's giving God glory and recognizing that God will have to do the moving on the heart of, of someone who is a pagan king. And he prays first. He's brokenhearted and then he prays. You and I, we often get into situations where we pray 
last, or we pray down the line somewhere, something will go wrong with our family, and that's usually how it happens. One of your children, one of your grandchildren, somebody in your family, your spouse, work, you get laid off, the mortgage still needs to be paid, there's no money coming in, and we start going crazy. And at some point in that process, we, we pray and we cry out to God. Well, that ought to be our first move, even before all the bad stuff happens. That was Nehemiah's first move. After he was brokenhearted, he prays a prayer. And then what does he do? And this is where you come in. Several of you over the next number of months are going to look at something here or dream of something that we could do here. And together with the new pastor and that team, you're gonna say, you know, somebody ought to do something about that and I need to be part of it because it's on my heart. I'm brokenhearted about this. I'm brokenhearted that as a church, we don't fill in your own blank, whatever it is. I'm brokenhearted about that. And so I wanna lend my muscle to whatever this is. So after Nehemiah is brokenhearted, after he kneels down and prays and implores God's help in all of this, what we see next is he stood up and he acted now, let me tell you something. Most churches that I work with that are in your situation now, and there are a number of them, and they are all over 30 months of waiting for a pastor. So have you. Uh, Mark, I, I think I figured this out. We were about 34 months or 35 months or so since Pastor G till now, something like that. Well, you're right in there with all the other churches that are looking. You know why? There's this many churches looking, and there's only this many graduating from Bible college and seminary. So, you are entering that next season where there's going to be a renewal here and a rebirthing of all of what this means to be, to be Abundant Life Baptist Church here in Washington City. What most churches do is that they will pray and they'll They'll have prayer groups and they'll meet through that time. They'll hold things together. But then when it's time to act, I mean really act, everybody is waiting for the pastor to do it. Or he's got some kind of magic pixie dust that he'll sprinkle and make things all happen by magic pixie dust. And it doesn't work that way. There, there has to become a moment when you've prayed that you have to stand up and act. And that's where most churches fall down. This one won't. I know you well enough now. You, your legacy past, your recent history, and this congregation sitting in front of me right now, I know you well enough to know that this will not be you. When it's time to stand up and act on somebody should do something about that, you will. You will either work together with a new pastor and, and the leadership team, or you'll approach them and say, this is a singular mission that I'm thinking about. I could do it myself with a small team. Can we do it? Will you help me get this started? Nehemiah is brokenhearted because he's saying somebody should do something about that, and God is saying, yeah, it should be you, Nehemiah. So he puts together a team. They secure the king's blessing and all of his money and his army and his resources and the lumber yard. The king grants to Nehemiah an entire forest to remake these giant doors and the doorposts and the lintels and everything that's needed to rebuild this wall. They don't have to go to Stone Depot. You know why? Because all the stone's laying on the ground. It's all right there. What they don't have is they don't have caterpillars and bulldozers and, and cranes and four-wheeled four articulated loaders. They don't have any of that. They have to do it by hand. And they do. 40 feet high, two and a half miles around, nine feet at the base. In 52 days, they had the thing built to half of its height. If I come back here later, that'll be a later part of the, the, the series. They actually do it. They stood up and they, they did it. And they did it with great opposition, even to the point of physical threat and even to the point of attempted murder with their leadership. They stood up and they acted. They were brokenhearted. 
they knelt down and they prayed and asked for God's help because it was God's calling that they do this. And they stood up and they acted. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me. By the way, Nehemiah is talking to his team of people here. And what the king had said to me, they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And so here's the Nehemiah principle that you guys are going to have to have over this next year. This is it. Next screen. This is the Nehemiah principle. First there's tears, then there's prayers, and then there's actions. And you have lived through the first two. You live through the, the tears of the lumpy times that you've had. They're in the rearview mirror now. In fact, going forward in this automobile called Abundant Life Baptist Church, take the rear view mirror off the dashboard or the roof of the car and put that on the floor because you can't drive the car going forward staring into the rear view mirror, can you? Not for very long before you hit something. Don't drive the car looking in the rear view mirror. That should only be done when you need to check out if the policeman's right behind you. And when I go home on the turnpike, I actually know where they hide now. Isn't that great, learning that? That's a useful piece of information right there. You should write that down. You can't drive the car looking in the rearview mirror, and I don't want you to either. You've come through some, some scrapes and some hard times. You've come through that. There's been tears. There's been a lot of praying done here. And I know, because I've talked to enough of you. And very shortly, beginning from today on, will be action. And I want you to stand up and do something after all of these prayers. And that's the Nehemiah principle that you see at work here with this. And so, as we come right to the end, uh, let's just stop here for just a minute. I'm going to invite up those who are going to be serving. Why don't you make your way up? No formality. Just come out of your seats. Come and take your places here. I, I, I want to use uh, what we're doing here as the end point of my sermon, actually. So th thank you for not marching. Just come right up. So my, my final thought for the sermon before we transition to this table is what is your, somebody ought to do something about that moment of opportunity. I don't know what it is. I, I, don't, I don't know whether it's a new ministry to be started here. I don't know whether it's something that needs to be repaired around here. I don't know whether it's an unusual amount of people that, that need pastoral care, that, that the a new pastor or any pastor could not keep up with, but you could. I recently heard, I just heard, I'm so sorry about Ray. I, I just heard this, it was two weeks ago, something like that. And um, I, I grew used to seeing him. I would almost be the first one here and he would be here already going in, in, the, in the conference room, getting ready for his class. I don't know what somebody ought to do something about that moment is for you, but there is one for each one of you. I don't know what it is. You have to determine that. And after God puts into your heart what it is, it might be a collective thing that you all do. It might be what one or two of you do. It might be what a team of you does. But there is a somebody ought to do something about that moment. That's an opportunity for all of us. And just like Nehemiah, who had an insurmountable task, which we do not, I am not comparing us to a broken down, burned, and smashed flat Jerusalem. I'm not saying that that's what we are, but we are looking at the next season and it's gonna need, it's gonna need everybody to be part of that. So what is your somebody ought to do something about that moment?